Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. You're listening to Cup of Parenting podcast and I'm your host Aisha, a pediatric speech and language therapist, mom of seven and parenting coach here in the UK. Today we're going to be discussing Islam and mental health, a practical approach to a sound mind. And this is a topic that's interested me because of my psychological background and also because I think in this current climate where everybody's isolating at home and, you know, we're all in lockdown, I feel like this is a really, really important topic, especially for people who may be more vulnerable and susceptible to suffering from mental health disorders. And even for those of us who don't usually suffer from mental health disorders, it's probably a time where we would be more prone and vulnerable to um, our mental health being affected by the impact of having to be indoors for such a long time. So if you start off by talking about what is mental health, So your mental health includes your emotional, social and psychological well-being. And mental health has an impact on your thoughts, your feelings and your behaviour. This translates into the decisions you make in life. Now the most common mental health disorders experienced by people worldwide include types of depressions, schizophrenia and anxiety disorders and you probably know lots of other ones as well. The prevalence of mental health disorders are more common than you might think. So in the United Kingdom, for example, an estimated one in six adults have experienced a common mental health disorder like depression or anxiety in the past week. This is according to the National Health Service, the NHS. And across the pond in the United States of America, this increases to an estimated one in four American adults who have suffered from a diagnosable mental health disorder in a given year, subhanAllah. So this is actually really, really common. Even though these disorders are so common, there's actually a stigma attached to them and the fear of being labelled is what prevents Muslims from accessing the necessary medical aid and support. However, there's lots of effective strategies that you can find in the Quran and Sunnah when you feel like you are struggling with your mental health And that's what I want to discuss today. Let's have a look at some of the essential approaches that we can take as Muslims. The first one is to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as a Muslim, you should always depend on the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and have the full and firm belief that he has a decree over all things. Don't forget that nothing can happen without the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing can be prevented without the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say, never will we be struck except by what Allah has decreed for us. He is our protector. And upon Allah, let the believers rely, subhanAllah. Now, it doesn't mean that you should just have belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean that you just say, oh, I believe in Allah and that's enough. No, it means that your belief should be deepened to trusting his judgment and believing that his judgment is always in your best interest. So having iman means you have belief in your heart. It means you profess this with your tongue and through your speech. For example, say you read Quran, you read du'as. And having iman also means you demonstrate the belief with your actions. For example, you pray salah. So you have to combine all of these things. And that's how you put your trust in Allah ultimately. It's very important to do this on a much more deeper level. Now, the second thing we can do as Muslims is do ruqya. Now, as per the sunnah, a Muslim can easily recite the ruqya to keep themselves protected. And the very famous ones that you would already may already know are things like Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah An-Nas. Three times, yeah, and you blow the, this into your hands each time and wipe over your face and whatever you can reach of your body. Now, if you turn towards... Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is our role model, it was narrated that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was ill, he would recite the Al-Muaddatayn, which are the last two surahs of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Falaq and Surah An-Nas, over himself and spit dryly. When his pain grew intense, I recited over him and wiped him with his own hand, seeking its barakah, its blessing. Now, a person can also recite Surah Al-Fatiha 
at any time and ayat al-kursi before bedtime as well as reciting the last three surahs three times each at bedtime. So these are sort of small surahs but very meaningful and very powerful that we can use um, as tools to help us. We can do self-ruqya at any time. You can also recite the ruqya of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the dua. Allahumma rabban nasi mudhib al-ba'si ishfi anta shafi la shifa illa anta shifa alla yugadiru saqaman. So O Allah, Lord of mankind, the one who relieves hardship, grant healing, for there is no healer but you, a healing that leaves no trace of sickness. And this is a dua reported in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. The next thing we can do as Muslims is make dua. And as a Muslim, subhanAllah, dua is one of the most powerful tools at your disposal. Remember the etiquettes of making dua. You should have sincere intention when making dua. You must believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can meet your need. You must repent and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must ask for forgiveness for any sins. Really humble yourselves before the Creator and really think about what it is that you're doing. You're talking to your Creator. You're asking for something. So, of course, you've got to get into the right mindset, you know, humble yourself and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you ask for what it is that you want. So, you can begin by glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Surah Ghafir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and your Lord says, call upon me, I will respond to you, subhanAllah. So you can also recite the dua of the person in distress. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrated that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say at the time of distress, La ilaha illallah al-azim al-halimu, la ilaha illallah rabbul arsh al-azim, la ilaha illallah rabbul samawati wa rabbul ardi wa rabbul arsh al-kareem. There is no God but Allah, the majestic, the tolerant. There is no God but Allah, the Lord of the great throne. There is no God but Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the Lord of the earth and the Lord of the noble throne. And this has also been narrated by Al-Bukhari. Another thing you can do as Muslims is seek medical help. SubhanAllah. This is something that sometimes people refuse to do. But Islamically, a person should also seek medical assistance when needed to treat their ailments. And it's really important to note medical treatment includes diseases that are physical or mental in nature. So the word da or disease or sickness in the hadith is general in meaning and this includes all type of sickness. So not just physical sickness but also if you're mentally being affected and you need to get, you know, get treatment for your mental health, you can go out, well you should be going out and doing this as well. It's been narrated that Anas radiallahu anhu said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when Allah created the disease, he also created the cure. So seek the cure. SubhanAllah. So it's really important that you um, try and seek medical help or support someone who needs to seek medical help or be supportive of someone who is currently receiving medical help rather than looking at them in a negative manner just because it might be... Um, help relating to their mental health rather than physical health and I think we're a bit more accepting and it's a bit more common when someone's ill and you can physically see it that you're a bit more sympathetic towards them you know supportive towards them and you're more understanding that okay maybe they've hurt their arm leg head stomach whatever whereas when it's someone suffering from um, mental health disorder it's much more harder because the symptoms might not be obvious to you you might not be able to see them you might not be able to understand that they're suffering but subhanAllah we should treat them as seriously as you would if someone is suffering from a physical condition and that brings me on to the next point we can do which is providing a support network to help those who are suffering silently subhanAllah if you're aware that someone is having difficulties reach out and talk to them talking is a vital part of human communication yet how many people suffer from loneliness because they've got no one to converse with especially now today in this society you know because of this covid lockdown that we're experiencing subhanallah how many people have reached out to people who are lonely and how many people are suffering because they're all alone at home it only takes a minute to send a message or make contact but can mean a huge deal to the one who is suffering 
If you have the facility to set up support groups in the masjid or your local community, you should be doing this. Even pointing someone in the right direction to gain further support can be really useful or even just being there for them. Don't forget how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ helped people. Abu Bakr anhu would discreetly attend to an elderly blind woman and take care of her chores and household duties. She was unaware of who he was and he kept his deeds private. It was only discovered and relayed by another companion when he witnessed this, subhanAllah. And the final point is to have patience. Under any situation, a Muslim must exercise patience, sabr, and patience is one of the best qualities of a Muslim's character. Remember the Qur'an is a guide for all of mankind and the Qur'an guides us to be patient. Indeed, there are over 90 verses in the Holy Qur'an relating to patience. And Allah loves the steadfast in Surah Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, the patient will be given their reward without account in Surah Az-Zumar. If things get really, really difficult and tough, look at those around you who are in a situation worse than yours. This may put things into perspective for you. I'm not saying this will make your illness any less, but it may be that somebody's suffering more than you and you can realize that, you know, there's a lot more suffering going on in the world and put it into a little bit of perspective. Don't forget the example of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever remains patient, Allah will bestow peace upon him. And no one is ever given anything better and more pa- generous than patience, subhanAllah. And it's been said by Imam ibn al-Qayyim who said, There are three types of patience. Firstly, practicing patience to fulfill the obligation and do righteous. Secondly, abstaining from evil and prohibited acts. And thirdly, practicing patience during times of hardship without complaints, which I guess is a lot relevant to us uh, in this day and age and at the moment. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the ability to apply the Islamic teachings to our daily lives. And I hope you enjoyed and benefited from listening to this podcast. Wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.